everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Julie Horn and I am the Visual Arts Director here at the Maine Arts Commission. And we want to thank you for taking time to join us for the next hour for a really important information session. Diane Sturgeon is the Deputy District Director at the Maine District Office of the U.S. Small Business Administration who will walk us through financial opportunities available. Please feel free to share who you are and your organization in the chat box as we get going. We've saved some time at the end for your questions. Uh, so if you could try to put them in a chat box closer to the end of the session so we can quickly refer to them. Also, before we all leave for the day, we're going to show a one question pop up box on the screen. Please take a second and use your cursor to click on one of the answers. This quick survey helps us to understand what information you feel is of value for your limited time. Now I'd like to introduce you to our new interim director, David Greenham. Hi, thanks, Julie and uh, Ryan. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for joining us today. Uh, as Julie said, my name is David Greenham and I'm the, the new uh, interim director of the Maine Arts Commission. I actually haven't started yet. I don't start till Monday. Um, and, uh, uh, but I wanted to make sure you knew that, that our focus um, for uh, probably a good part of the rest of the year is going to be on helping organizations and individuals as we all uh, recover and rebuild and re-emerge stronger uh, from COVID. And uh, we are so thrilled that Diane has joined us for what I suspect will be the first uh, opportunity <laughs> to talk about these, uh, these programs that are gonna be so important to us. So thank you so much um, for joining us. Unfortunately, I have to jump off and go to another meeting, but, uh, but uh, Diane is uh, going to provide great information. Great, thanks so much, David. Hi, everybody. My name is Diane Sturgeon. I'm Deputy District Director for the U.S. Small Business Administration's Office here in Augusta, and I am also currently serving as our Acting District Director. We, um, our, our District Director, Amy Bassett, left in December to go back to New Hampshire in that role. So I'm covering for the time being until we get a District Director um, appointed or, or hired for the position. What I wanted to talk to, to everybody about today is our economic aid um, assistance that's available through the Small Business Administration, but I also do have a slide at the end where I want to talk a little bit about our regular programs and services that could also help your business out. So I hope this is helpful for you. I know I was we were just talking about before the call started, one of the saddest things for us right now is we still don't have a lot of information on SVOG. And I have a little list of things in front of myself that tells me what I am and am not allowed to talk about. I'll tell you the truth, in the district office, we don't have any inside scoop on this program. Because it's a grant program, the agency has to be very, very careful to ensure that all information relative to the grant goes out to all potential applicants at the same time. So a lot of times, if you call into the office and ask a question, we'll do our best to try and help you find the answer on the website. But we aren't going to necessarily be able to tell you anything other than what's on the, the website, because we just simply don't have the information. The biggest question everybody has right now is when will the application period begin? And I'm afraid we don't have an answer on that yet. They're kind of building this program as we're all waiting for it, um, not so patiently. The Office of Disaster was tasked with standing this program up from scratch, so they've been trying to get it put together. They have put some really good videos out on the website, and they are always ask, act, um, actively adding information to that website, so I strongly recommend everybody get out there and check that out as well, and I'll be sure to, to talk about what the website addresses are in the end. We have these programs that are available um, because we do have multiple programs running right now. We've got the Triple P program that I'll talk a little bit about, and that is a loan program, but it's a forgivable loan program. So there's a little bit of a grant aspect there. We're offering some debt relief on some of our existing loans. So for programs, um, for, for companies that have an existing 7A, 504, or SBA microloan, they may be receiving some debt relief through the form of us making payments for them. Then we have our Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. And that crosses over in between loans and grants because there was the um, idle advance program that people that applied prior to, I think we ran out of funds on that on July 7th. 
People who applied prior to that may have gotten an, uh, an advance, which turned into a grant because there was no need to repay that. And they may have also gotten an economic injury disaster loan, which is a traditional loan. And I'll talk a little about that program. And then there's the um, Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program, the SVOG that everybody is waiting not so patiently for more information on. To start off with, I'll start with the one that I, I tend to talk about the most because I deal with our lenders quite a bit as well as small business owners, Paycheck Protection. That program actually started last year in April and ran through August 9th. I actually ended on August 8th. And um, it's a forgivable loan program where, and our goal is for everybody to who gets that loan to be able to have that loan fully forgiven. That's the goal of the lenders. That was the goal of Congress when the, when the um, program was enacted. So that's a pretty consistent goal throughout, but it's a forgivable loan program. And we've recently with the Economic Aid Act expanded how that program, how those loan funds can be used, modified and tweaked a few things like there's a covered period and it was eight weeks or 24 weeks. Now it's been clarified to be between eight weeks and 24 weeks. And that's the amount of time that a business has to use the loan funds. We've added a second draw. Initially, it was a one and done program where you could get one triple P um, loan and that was it. Now we've en enacted a second draw. We've also reenacted the ability to get first draw loans, which we'll talk a, a bit about for anybody who didn't get a first draw loan prior to August 8th. We've allowed for or clarified, Congress clarified rather, because this was always, I think, our intent all along for the expenses to be deducted as well as the triple P loan not to be included or to be taxed. So when it started, we said triple P loan funds won't be taxed, even if they are forgiven. When the IRS kind of came in behind us and said, that's all well and good. That's what the legislation says, but it doesn't say anything about the business also being able to deduct the expenses. Well, with the Economic Aid Act, it was clarified. Both the expenses can be deducted as well as not being having to consider the triple P loan as income. Um, we updated the, the forgiveness form for loans of $150,000 or less, which honestly, um, it's more than 86% of the loans submitted in 2020. It's the vast majority of the loans in Maine. There's a one pager now, and I don't know how many, how many emails and phone calls I get during the week from lenders saying, is it true my customer only needs to give me this one page and doesn't need to give me any additional documents? And that is true. It's a one pager, but I always like to make sure people understand even though you don't have to turn all of that supporting documentation into your lender when you request forgiveness, you need to retain it for your files because there is potential that your loan will be pulled in a, in a random um, sampling or it may, be a, it may be a random sampling by us, it may be a random sampling by the Office of Inspector General, it may be something somebody else comes up with if they wanna see some documentation associated with the forgiveness of that loan. So um, you have to have that documentation available if your lender comes back to you and says, can you please provide those loan documents? And we no longer subtract the idle advance from the triple P loan forgiveness amount. So those idle advances were up to $10,000 issued to borrowers who applied for the economic injury disaster loan prior to funds running out in July. And uh, the way the, the legislation was written initially was if you came back, if you got both an idle advantage and a triple P loan, you couldn't be completely forgiven. They deducted the amount of the idle advance from your forgiveness. Congress came back and said, no, let's change that. And we've repaid everybody who we deducted their idle advance from their loan forgiveness. And we are no longer deducting that from the forgiveness. So that was a welcome change as well. A first draw loan is what we're referring to as the 2021 loans to people that did not get a loan prior to August 9th. Um, we kind of we talk about the 2020 triple P loans as 2020 triple P, first round triple P, um, legacy triple P loans, and then the new ones are first draw and second draw loans. And those are loans made after January of this year in response to the Economic Aid Act refunding the program in December. We expanded the eligibility to some different entity types. With SBA loan programs, normally we cannot make loans to nonprofits except through specific disaster loan programs. So normally we don't guarantee loans to nonprofits. While the triple P loan is a subset of the 7A program made through our lenders and we're guaranteeing the loan for them and then coming in the back end and paying it off, assuming you, you qualify for, get, for forgiveness. Legislation expanded the Triple P program to allow nonprofits, 501c3s, and 501c19s to qualify. And then with the Economic Aid Act, 
we added 501c6 destination marketing organizations and um, modified the affiliation rules around specific news news organizations and that was really like tv stations that have an affiliation with nbc or cbs or something like that we expanded co eligible covered expenses so businesses can use the funds for not only payroll you're required to use at least 60 percent of the loan funds for payroll if you want full forgiveness and i always like to point that out because we with the expansion there's a lot more that you can use the loan funds but you always if you want full forgiveness have to use at least 60 percent of your loan funds for forget for payroll there's a payroll protection program so regular payroll expenses um we expanded it to include PPE, modifications to your business that you might have had to do um, to address COVID, like putting up um, sneeze guards or those plexiglass shields everybody has now, or restaurants expanding their outdoor seating, that sort of thing. Some cloud computing costs, some costs associated with payroll expenses, and then the same expenses that were always out there, which was payroll, uh, rent expenses, utilities, or mortgage interest. And one thing to know about the SBA, when we say mortgage, we mean any secured debt. So it was just the interest on those could be included. We changed it from eight weeks or 24 weeks for a covered period to eight weeks, in between eight weeks and 24 weeks. And that's from the date of disbursement. So from the date that a borrower gets the funds, they have to use it, they have at least eight weeks to use the funds and up to 24 weeks. It's two and a half times average monthly payroll is your loan amount. And um, so that's about 10 weeks of payroll. So in theory, if you're still paying your regular payroll out, you could use all the loan funds up in 10 weeks, use it 100% for payroll and you know check that box request forgiveness and be done. But because not everybody has everybody back to work at the same um, level as they were in 2019 or 2020, um, we've stretched that a little bit or Congress stretched that a little bit. It also offers a little flexibility for businesses that um, are on more of a seasonal schedule. And when we talk about average monthly payroll, we're talking full year 2019, full year 2020, or for season, people who meet our seasonal definition or seasonal businesses, it's any 12 week period in between February 15th of 2019 and February 15th of 2020. We did allow certain borrowers to request an increase to their original or their legacy triple P loan if it wasn't clear when, we, um, when their loan was made as far as some um, eligibility rules. Uh, partnerships were one because partnerships were the only group where the owners could use K-1 distributions as their payroll. So they were able to come back and ask for an increase and seasonal businesses because there were some questions around how seasonal businesses could calculate their payroll expenses. For the Triple P program, and this is one of the fun things, Triple P has a rule, SBOG has a rule, um, and IDLE has their own rule about when you had to have been in operation or in business. For Triple P, the date is February 15th of 2020. A business has to have been in operation by that date to qualify. And for Triple P, the program's available until March 31st of this year or until congressional appropriations run out. I do always like to make sure people understand, although the program's open until March 31st, and we do expect funds to last that long. We've got just shy of about $100 billion left available in the program right now. Um, we expect the funds to last that long, but your, your application needs to have been processed by your lender and submitted to the SBA and approved by the SBA by March 31st. We have to issue our loan number. And it takes a little bit of time for all of those things to happen. Your lender has to do some due diligence and review your application. They submit it into a system with us. In this round, we're doing some pre-screening to make sure the um, social security numbers match, make sure the business, um, we check like Lexus, Nexus, uh, treasuries do not pay list and that sort of thing. Make sure there's nothing out there to indicate that we couldn't, we couldn't legally make a loan to the company or the applicant and then we issue our loan number. So it's important to give yourself a few days there. I always, I'm kind of recommending people give themselves at least a week before that March 31st date to um, get their application processed. Then there's the second draw program. So this was a big change. Like I said, originally Triple P was one and done. With the second draw program, borrowers who were specifically were more impacted um, by COVID were able to come back and request a second loan. And it's, a, it's still a forgivable loan. It's still based on average payroll. It still requires the 60% of the loan amount be used 
to pay payroll to, to qualify for full forgiveness. And even though I'm saying 60%, you can always use 100% of the loan for payroll to get full forgiveness. It also was modified a bit to target the smaller businesses. And I always kind of laugh a little bit when we say smaller businesses and we're talking about 300 employees or less, that's still pretty big for me. Most of our businesses qualify as small based on SBA standards anyway. I think it's 99.7% of all businesses in Maine qualify as small based on SBA's definition. But that 300 employee limit does rule a few people out, especially because it takes into consideration any affiliated businesses. So if there are affiliates, you have to add all of your employees and it's a head count, not an FTE count. So you have to add all of your employees together to make sure you have 300 or less. Businesses also had to show that they suffered a 25% reduction in gross receipts based either full year 2019 compared to full year 2020 or any quarter in 2019 compared to the same quarter in 2020. So, and if a business wasn't open for full year of 2019, there's, a, there's some flexibility there about what quarter you have to compare to and that sort of thing. Most businesses still get two and a half time average monthly payroll. Again, um, loan amounts were reduced for the second draw. It's up to $10 million on first draw. It's only up to 2 million on the second draw. So again, that's one of the reasons the money is going a little more slowly, but it's also to target those small businesses. And um, we added a tweak because accommodations and food services were more severely impacted. Congress put in a rule that if they the business has a NAICS code of 72, they could use three and a half time average monthly payroll. Covered period is still eight to 24 weeks. And um, again, they have to use all of those funds, minimum of 60% used for payroll, and then come back to their lender and request forgiveness. The process for a triple P application is you actually go to a lender. And we say find a PPP lender. It's almost every bank in the state a lot of the credit unions, we have a couple of alternative lenders. So I always rec recommend that people talk to their actual traditional lender, whoever they do business with, who, who holds your deposit accounts and your other lending. And they'll probably be able to take your application. If they are not able to take your application, we have a program out there called sba.gov slash lender match is the website, but it's lender match. And I would say lender match is like match.com for borrowers and bankers or borrowers and lenders. You go in, you put in your information as a borrower about your type of business, where you're located and what you're looking for. Lenders have gone in and put in their information saying who they're willing to talk to and potentially make a loan for. The system matches you up. The lender gets an email, they'll reach out and contact you to take your application. You may hear from a local lender, you may hear from a, you know, a traditional lender or an alternative lender, or you may hear from a national lender. There are some online lenders like Lendio um, and some fintechs out there making loans, and that's absolutely fine. You can definitely use them, but it's I will admit it's a little easier if you stick with your traditional bank because you have that relationship here. So um, I always say that's the first place to start. We also have um, our resource partners out there who can offer assistance. And on our website, we have the Paycheck Protection Program um, information out there. If you go to sba.gov slash PPP, you're gonna find all of this information. You do your application, you give it into your lender, your lender does their due diligence and review, they submit it to us, we do our quick review, and then we issue a loan number, the lender issues the funds, you sign loan documents with your lender, everything is done with the lender. You don't really have to deal with us at all. It's, it's all gone through the lender and they deal, deal with us. Again, March 31st is the deadline or um, when appropriated funds run out, we expect the funds will last, but don't wait till the last possible minute for that. Um, I did mention Triple P is a forgivable loan. When it comes time to request forgiveness, you're going to go through your lender for that as well. Again, the lender will be the one dealing with the SBA. You'll deal with your lender. Then there's our Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, or our EIDL program, as how you'll hear, hear most of us talk about EIDL. That provides economic aid to businesses who suffered a loss due to COVID. Um, it was originally set to sunset on December 31st of 2020. Congress allowed us to extend it, or I think it was a congressional action. Anyway, we've extended it through December 31st of 2021. That program seemed tremendous interest. I think there were like 14 or 15 million applications that have gone through the queue there, and some are still obviously in the queue being worked. It's a different program. It's a true loan. So it's on very favorable terms, but it's still a loan. It's something you're going to have to pay back. 
Our disaster loan program offers a much broader eligibility um, standards than a traditional 7A or SBA guaranteed loan. So nonprofits normally would qualify for the disaster loan program. And you can use the funds for a lot more than you can use triple P loan funds for. Economic injury disaster loans can be used for all of your normal business expenses. So you can make your actual mortgage payments, you can make your rent payment, pay utilities, pay payroll, um, pay any normal expenses and fix the debts that you have out there. So that's, that's much easier. You don't have to be quite so um, specific in your tracking there. The terms are 30-year term, 3.75% interest rate for for-profit businesses and 2.75 for not-for-profits. There are no personal guarantees at this time because although based on statute, we're allowed to make loans up to $2 million to stretch funds and also to try to reach as many people as possible and also to allow us to get the funds out more quickly. We've decided to cap those at $150,000 right now. There may be some movement on that in the future, so stay tuned. But for now, those loans are capped at $150,000 with no personal guarantees. And the only collateral is if the loan is more than $25,000, we file a blanket UCC filing, which means we take a blanket lien on everything you know that you own, but we're not taking a specific mortgage or a specific um, security interest in any specific equipment. So it's something a UCC filing that would show up. If you go out to get additional um, funding at a later date and your lender needs a needs us to subordinate, they go through a process to request that from us. And for the most part, we're trying to accommodate those because um, we don't want to stop people from doing their normal business. Eligibility, as I said, is a little broader than with our normal programs, small businesses, cooperatives. Ag enterprises get a little weird because we have to make sure that there's no crossover between us and um, USDA and RD and FSA and the, the groups that are specific to ag, but we are able to do some ag enterprises. And it's people with our businesses with 500 or fewer employees or that meet our defined uh, size standards, as well as private nonprofits. And when we say private nonprofits, we're just not talking about municipality or uh, owned nonprofits. It's just your regular 501c3, that sort of thing. Then there's the idle advance. So there was the original idle advance that came out and when it was written, it was Congress said we could make up to $10,000 grants to or advances to small businesses that wouldn't have to be paid back. Again, to try to stretch funding and get money out to as many people as possible. What the SBA did was we made grants to people for, um, we did $1,000 per employee when they applied for an idle loan. Congress has now said, go back and, and refund those people up to the full 10,000 if they meet some specific requirements. And that's where we get into the targeted idle advance. We are actually emailing people who may qualify. So that's one of those, don't call us, we'll call you. There's no place to jump out of the website to try to apply. You have to get an email from our, um, from our Office of Disasters portal that will say, okay, you may qualify for an idle advance, fill out this information and we'll, we'll start the process. If you know straight away you're not gonna qualify, you, know, you don't have to do it. You can just ignore it and move on with your day. But if you think you might qualify or you're trying to figure out if you qualify, the qualifiers are initially, are you in a low income community? And that's based on an IRS definition. Um, so there's a mapping tool out on our website that you can check if your community is low income. So are you in a low income community? And did you suffer greater than a 30% economic loss? And that again is a gross receipt comparison. I think it's over an eight week period. And again, trying to target the truly small businesses. Do you have 300 or fewer employees? If you have more than 300 employees, boom, you know, you're not eligible don't even bother it's you know don't don't take the time but if you think you may qualify you know you can go out and check the mapping tools see if you're in a low-income community check your math as far as your comparison between 2019 and 2020 and go ahead and fill out the application office of disaster will review the initial application if they see you make it through the first check they're going to be in touch with you to get an irs 4506t form which is that tax transcripts form um, and then what will happen is if you if you qualify, if you go all the way through and you do qualify, if say you only got $4,000 on your first idle advance, 
you're going to get the additional 6,000 to get you up to a full 10,000. So that's another check. If you already got the full 10,000 and you get this invitation, you know you're not going to get any more money. So not really worth your time to fill out the application. These applications, we're telling people be very, very careful when you do it. Make sure your banking information is correct. Make sure your 2019 tax information, your pay, your um, your income information is correct and it matches your taxes. Have your 2019 taxes in front of you that you filed with the IRS in front of you when you fill it out. Because the Office of Disaster is trying to process these as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So they're not gonna go back and forth with people to try to clarify. So make sure you fill everything out accurately. And again, we'll reach out to those people who, who potentially do qualify, continue to process the application, and then funds will show up in your bank account if you qualify and are awarded the um, targeted advance. The way those are working is we're sending out applications initially to people who um, got a portion of or got the, the first idle advance prior to, I think, that July 7th date. And then we're targeting people who didn't get any funding in 2020, but applied for an IDA loan in 2020. So it's people who applied after funding ran out through December um, 27th, I think, of 2020. Then if we still have money left over after we've paid all of those people, paid all of the second batch of people, we'll start looking at people who applied in 2021. Honestly, there were 15 million applications in that first go around. There's a limited amount of funding. I don't know if we're gonna to get to anybody who applies in 2021, but you never know. It, it's worth applying for the idle, idle loan if you think you were gonna need an idle loan and maybe we'll either get more money for the funding program or for the idle advance program or um, fewer people will, will qualify in the second round. So don't hesitate if you think you could benefit from an idle advance loan or an idle um, loan to apply for an idle loan just because you're not gonna get an advance. Now for the meat, everybody wants to know about Shuttered Venue Operators Grant. And as I said, because it's a grant program in the district office, we're super limited in what we can talk about. And I'm gonna get my cheat sheet because it tells me exactly what I'm allowed to talk about. Um, we can refer you to the website. We can talk about what's on the website. We can talk about registering for SAM.gov because that is critical. And that's one of the only things we can really push you to do right now because we know everybody who's going to apply for a, an SVOG um, needs to be registered as a potential um, grant grantee on SAM.gov. SAM.gov is not our website. It's GSA's website and it's the website where everybody who either contracts with the federal government or receives a grant from the federal government um, is registered there to say they are eligible to do business with the federal government. On our website at, at sba.gov slash coronavirus relief, there is a um, video that talks you through the SAM registration process. It takes time. So if you have not already registered for SAM, on SAM, get out there and do that now. Even if you're not absolutely positively sure you want to apply for an SVOG, get out there. It doesn't, doesn't cost you anything to do it other than your time. And it's helpful to be out there and know that you're already in there if you do choose to apply for an SVOG. Um, SVOG, we, the other things we can't do, we can't talk to you about your, we can't help you figure out whether or not you're eligible. We can't help you figure out what your gross revenues are or what your um, earned revenues are. We can't help you figure out your employee headcount. A lot of these specific things we can't help you do. We can't help you fill out your application when the application process becomes available. But our resource partners can help you. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about who they are at the end of the call. But it's SBDC SCORE, Women's Business Center, or the Veterans Business Outreach Center. They can all help you. And I know our SBO, SBDC, or Small Business Development Center, has already been in touch with um, with DC and said, look, we want to know as much as we can about this program because we want to be able to help people. So they're at the ready to, to do this once the information becomes available. So just understand, we're not trying to be difficult if you call the district office and ask us for help. We just legally, we're not allowed to do a lot of things because it is a federal grant program and as federal employees and a federally funded um, agency, and we're the ones doing the grants, there's only so much we can do. So entities that are eligible, live venue operators or promoters, theater producers, live performing arts organizations and motion picture theater operators, relevant um, museum operators, zoos and aquariums, museums and movie theaters are the one that have the special rules around fixed seating. So just uh, be aware of that. Talent reps and you up to five business entities that are affiliated with the same entity. 
can apply. If you are an entity that has 10 subsidiaries, only five are going to be able to apply. So you figure out, um, you know, where best to, to focus your um, attention in that case. You have to have been in operation by February 29th of 2020. And um, you cannot, and this is a real problem for a lot of us, you cannot have applied or received a second batch um, triple P loan. So one of the 2021 triple P loans. So if you got a triple P loan prior to August 9th, you're okay. But if you've even applied for one in this new round of triple P funding, you're not eligible to apply for SVOG unless your um, triple P application is actually denied. This is extremely frustrating. We recognize it's frustrating. It's frustrating for us too, because the SVOG application isn't even out there yet. There's limited funding for SVOG. It's my understanding there's only $15 billion um, allocated for this program. That's not a lot of money when you think nationwide, those funds going out. So people are trying to figure out, do I apply for SVOG or do I apply for triple P? SVOG can use for, be used for a lot more than triple P. And for the way most venues are structured, you probably get more from SVOG than you will from triple P. But are you gonna get the, S, the SVOG? And it, we understand it's hard, we understand it's frustrating. We feel your pain, we're right there with you. But at this point, it's one of those things you're just going to have to make that decision yourself. What I'm encouraging people to do is if they're on the fence, talk to your lender and get have your triple P application like lined up, queued up, ready to go. Ask them to hold it. If you've applied with your lender, that's fine. We don't even, that doesn't impact us at all. It's if your lender's inputted into our system at that point, it becomes a true application for us. And then at that point, if they put it into our system, you are shut out on SVOG until, unless it is, the application is actually denied. So keep that in mind. The Office of Disaster put together this little crosshatch to kind of help people figure out what does each program do and how does it impact each other. The COVID Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is, is kind of unwound from everything relative to SVOG and Triple P now. So that's kind of out there on its own, but then you've got what the SVOG, what the rules are and, and what can be used for and what Triple P can be used for. So this is just kind of one of those things for reference that they put out there. And then programs and services that are available to you in, in um, general for you and that can also help you with both your triple P, your IDLE, or your um, SVOG application. SVA does, you know, we've been around for a long time. Just a lot of people didn't apparently know about us. We have always had resource partners who offer free um, business development or business counseling services. There's the Maine Small Business Development Center, Women's Business Center, SCORE, or Veterans Business Outreach Center. We uh, Veterans Business Outreach Center is housed out of Rhode Island that services um, Region 1, which is all of New England, but they do have a representative here in state. SCORE is a volunteer-run organization, and they have chapters scattered all throughout, the, all throughout the state and all throughout the country, so they have a national network as well. Women's Business Center, again, a national set, uh, network, but our Women's Business Centers in Maine are hosted by CEI, and we have two, and they just received a grant to do a third Women's Business Center, so there will be a third one coming soon, and then our Maine Small Business Development Centers. They have, um, they have business advisors scattered all around the state, but and CEI hosts some, AVCOG hosts some, and USM hosts some, and NMDC up in Arista County. At this point, everybody's working virtual anyway, so it doesn't really impact you where they sit, but they are, we're, we're super lucky in this state. And I, you know, I say that a lot is that we're really, really lucky because we have lenders who are truly committed to our programs and truly committed to small businesses, but we have resource partners who are second to none. Portland SCORE was actually the number one SCORE chapter in the country. I think it was last year, year before last, and they're always up towards the top. Our SBDC, um, they are super involved nationally and just really tied in and always willing to jump in and do anything. And our Women's Business Center obviously has been extremely successful because we've just awarded them a third center in this state, which is huge. That's not really the norm. So we've got that whole group and they can offer you help with everything from really soup to nuts with your business. Startup, um, how you're running it, you know, what you can do to adjust to, to address for address COVID or just regular business, um, you know, challenges. 
if you want to grow, if you're if you're trying to succession plan out, we always strongly encourage you to talk to one of our counselors to kind of get yourself set up there to be ready to succession plan and get somebody new and in, in to run your business. So they're there for everything. Then there's the access to capital channel. Um, SBA does not do any direct lending other than through our disaster loan program. What we do is we guarantee loans for traditional lenders to help them make loans that they would not otherwise make. So there's a credit elsewhere standard there. If you can get a non-SBA um, guaranteed loan, I always say more power to you, get that non-SBA guaranteed loan. But if your lender is not able to make a traditional commercial loan for you, they can always look to an SBA guarantee to see if that might help them mitigate the risk associated with the loan and help them make the loan. We also lend money to SBA micro lenders and we have five of them in the state. There's Northern Maine Development Corp, Corp up in Arista County. There's Mainstream, um, which is uh, out of Penquist Cap, out of Bangor. Then there is CEI, um, AVCOG and Community Concepts. So scattered all over the state, and they can all make um, micro loans or loans up to $50,000 to small businesses that can't get traditional lending. They also offer traditional uh, technical assistance and quite often they tie in with our resource partners to do some of that. We help facilitate contracting with the federal government. So I always say the federal government buys goods and services, pretty much everything from number two pencils to Tomahawk missiles. So if you sell a good or a service, the federal government may buy that good or service. So if you wanna do contracting or sell to the federal government, we help facilitate that. And then we have our disaster loan program, that economic injury disaster loan program, but also our physical disaster loan program that's out there. Like right now, there was just a declaration in Texas because of everything that's gone on there. You hear about us a lot when there are wildfires or hurricanes or that flooding, that sort of thing. Um, most recently, obviously, the Idle Loan Program. The website's down at the bottom of that page. If you just go to sba.gov, you can get to any of these resources um, for any of the COVID-related resources, so Triple P, Idle, SVOG. There's a full bar across the top of the page. You just click that. It will take you into a page where you can link to everything. The SVOG website is sba.gov slash SVO grant. And on that website, you'll find the FAQs. There are about a 20-page FAQ document that's really helpful. There are videos out there that are on, um, it's, there's a broad overview one that Barb Carson did. There's one on um, live venue and promoter eligibility. There's one on talent rep eligibility. And there's also one on how to get registered on SAM.gov. That website's being updated all the time. So as I said, definitely jump out there and take a look on that website if you have any questions. And to stay in touch and just um, keep up on what we're doing, we we put out uh, e-newsletters. We call them Gov Deliveries. If you go to sba.gov slash updates, you can sign up for not only the Gov Deliveries from Maine, you can sign up for the national Gov Deliveries, or um, you can sign up for one specific disaster, specific exporting. There are a whole bunch out there. You can choose what you sign up for, and you can unsubscribe at any time. So if after all this is over, you don't want to hear from us anymore, you can definitely unsubscribe. We, we put out from the main district office, we'll put out updates about all these programs. As soon as we get information, we get it out through that channel. And we also put out information about upcoming trainings, webinars, that sort of thing. So it's a great resource. We are out on Twitter, um, either at SBA.gov is the national Twitter handle and at SBA Maine is ours for the district office. If you have questions, I ask that you email main underscore do at sba.gov. That's our general email box. So either myself or one of the other members of the main district office staff will reach out to you to answer your question or to put you in touch with somebody who can help you out. Our general phone number is 207-622-8551. And then I've got the other um, websites out there, the just general coronavirus relief website, the PPP website and SVO grant website. So feel free to hit any of those for more information. And they are being updated all the time. So, you know, check back often. Now I'll turn it over. I'll let Julie let me know what questions we might have out there. Thank you, Diane. I also wanted to remind people that this is actually being recorded. So if you've missed anything or you want to go back and get the, the information and a, and a chance to really digest it, um, it will be uh, the Maine Arts Commission will make it available on our website. So we do have a few questions. And um, the first one is asked, um, do you have any information about um, potential extensions of the PPP loans beyond March 31st? 
I don't have any information about that at this time. I know there is a campaign out there between lenders and different different organizations um, lobbying Congress because that would take congressional action. So they are lobbying Congress and a letter has been delivered to them asking to have it extended. I saw one that said something about extending, you know, requesting that it be extended at least until June 30th. We don't know anything, so we'll have to just wait for congressional action on that one. Very good. Um, do nonprofits have to have employees to be eligible? For the, um, actually, I believe on both the programs, there has to be at least somebody paid. Or, uh, let me be careful here. Okay, Triple P, you definitely have to have employees. It's it's for payroll. For SVOG, I'm gonna look at the, at the um, I'm gonna look at the FAQ, but I believe it talks about nonprofits have to have paid employees for a couple of different positions to qualify as well as charge for certain events. So I would say double check on the FAQ for that because there is there is language in there about that. Very good. Um, how is earned income defined for nonprofits well, that receive donations and grants? So that's one of those things that I can't I can't guide you on, but I can say go back and look. And I will say one of the things you gotta love about the federal government is we mix we mix we mix metaphors, so to speak. We mix phrases. So we talk about earned revenue and we talk about gross revenue, and then we talk about gross earned revenue. And um, it starts on page sixteen of the um of the FAQs where we talk about revenue. Don't get thrown by that gross earned revenue. That's really, it seems to be just the earned revenue. It's just talking about all of your earned revenue. Um, and it's it does carve out some of the donations and some of the grants and some of that. And it talks about earned revenue being, um, I can read it to you exactly, but I think it talks about earned revenue being from the sale of goods and services. Um, let's see. Yeah, gross earned revenue is a total of earned revenue from various sales of goods or services, such as admission tickets, merchandise, food and beverages, advertising sales, and contracted presentation income. And then on number three, which is on the top of page 17, it says, are donations and contributions included in gross earned revenue? And the answer is no. So we we do leave some, I know like some people were talking about the fact that, you know, we did a lot of other things just to try to get by this year. And there were capital campaigns and that sort of thing. Those funds are are carved out, so they're not included in your earned revenue. Very good. Um, what if PPP runs out and we don't get SVG? It's putting many of us in a bind to wait. Do you have any advice? I wish I could give you an answer on this one because it is. It's putting you in a terrible bind. And we all know that here and completely understand it. And we're equally as frustrated by it. Our problem is that we, there was such a short period of time and, um, for both programs, but we had to build SVOG and Office of Disaster are still trying to build it. So it does put you in a really hard bind. And people are, are having to make that choice of do we apply for SVOG or, or do we apply for Triple P? So I, you know, I feel your pain there, but I'm sorry, I, I can't make that decision for you. Yeah, very good. Um, how about do you qualify for idle if you collect unemployment compensation? So idle, you you can't you can't double dip on things. So you can't pay yourself when you're also being paid for unemployment, but. Idle covers a lot more than just payroll. Idle will cover all of your regular expenses. So you could have gotten unemployment and then you start using your idle funds. So don't feel that you're excluded just because you got unemployment. Go ahead and if you think you want an idle loan, apply for that. Great. Um, another one, um, do you know if uh, municipality uh, owned venues are eligible for SVOG? Yeah, I believe that that is directly addressed in the FAQs that government owned entities can be eligible. So, yes, okay. you'd have to meet all the other eligibility requirements, too. So I can never say anyone is yes or no, but very good. OK, I'm just kind of scrolling through and I'm wondering if anybody else has any questions. I think I've covered everything that's in the chat or the Q&A. Um, if we haven't, and you want to quickly 
put those in there. I'll keep kind of looking for the next couple um, of minutes. Um, Diane, are there any last sort of overarching, like if there's three things or two things I could get across <laughs> to you today, these are the most important. Yeah, the big thing is, I you know, I feel your pain on not being able to decide or having to, to decide. I talked to one venue operator the other day and literally we were on the phone for about an hour just talking through all of the different things and going through the FAQs. And she kept saying, but what do I do? What do I do? And I wish, you don't know how much I wish we could tell you what to do. But as I've told many of the lenders, my 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 you know crystal ball is, is in the shop. So I don't know what's gonna happen in the future and I don't know what changes are gonna occur. Um, so just keep an eye on the website and run your numbers and figure out what makes the most sense for you. There are some set-asides with the SVOG program and there's gonna be some tiering and how applications are accepted and that is all out on the website, but it's still, it's a limited amount of funding. So it is really a tough choice to make. Very good. I'm gonna jump in here. We do have another question. Will there actually be a need for a written grant for SVOG? Or will it just be an application? Oh, it's it's the the application will be out there. You're not going to have to do like the the full grant um, type of application you would normally do. It'll be a specific application, most likely online, I suspect. But um, keep an eye on our website, and that'll come out. Very good. Another one um, for a SVOG grant. Um, do we need to calculate our financials by calendar versus fiscal year, and cash or accrual based accounting? It talks about the earned income being based on um, accrual, basic regular accrual method. And it does, I know in the FAQs, it talks about the fact that you'll use your fiscal year for your comparison. Very good. Okay. Um, we have run a business for 11 years, but closed for January, February, March. Are we eligible under the open by February 29th, 2020? Yeah, because you were in business or in operation prior to that date. And we get into that a lot. We had a lot of conversations about that during Triple P because of our seasonal businesses. A lot of them aren't open in February, they open up in May, but it's really was the business in existence and in operation prior to the start of the disaster. Great. Um, another question, will we need to gather all of our talent contracts for SVOG? You know what, I'm not exactly positive what you'll have to supply for documentation. Um, there are some rules around you, you know, you have to have at least this many of this and this many of that to qualify. So we'll have to wait and see. I suspect there will be a real broad eligibility determination made and then um, use of your financials to figure out the loan amount. And then you may have to provide some other documentation for support if there are further questions or if there's an audit of the file. But you're going to have to, I'm afraid we're going to have to wait and see what they ask for. Very good. Okay. I think from what I can see, if anybody has any other last minute question, it looks like we have made it through everything. Oh, wait, I just saw, sorry, I just saw another one. We've got so many, I'm glad we have the time. We're doing, we're doing good, Diane. <laughs> Diane actually has to jump off. She's got another um, presentation to go through right at two o'clock. So we wanna be really conscientious yeah. of her time. Um, this next one is says, um, hi, we're a nonprofit. I just uh, filled out the new idle advance that we were invited to submit. I used all of our income. <laughs> so okay, I'm not I'm sure. Sorry, I'm, oh, I'm, just, I'm not sure what the question is there. <laughs> um, I'm worried that I should not have included donations. We have had uh, we have had not earned income. So the idle advance program is a little different, and that's it's, we make everybody crazy, and especially me because I'm always trying to figure out what are the rules on each program. So that may look at things a little differently. It may ask for. It may, I'm not sure if that application actually asks for your gross number or your earned revenue number. So um, they're gonna look back on what you filed for paperwork with the, with the IRS if you filed taxes. Again, as a nonprofit, I'm not sure um, what you would have filed or used there. So. Okay, 
like a last check out. Okay. All right. Well, wow, Diane, thank you so much. This is a, thank you for taking a breath and in, uh, in between everything and, and helping us out. And um, thank you for offering us um, these extra um, resources to go to. It's been very helpful. Um, and I hope that we can continue to see and hear from you in the future. Any last parting words? Yeah, I would just strongly recommend, you know, get out on our website, keep an eye on our website, but don't hesitate to reach out to us at the main district office at main underscore do at sba.gov. If you have any questions, we'll do our best to help. We may end up referring you to somebody else for help and take advantage of our um, resource partners in this state. We are so lucky in the state to have such great resource partners and um, you've already paid for their services through your tax dollars. So you might as well take advantage of them. Use yeah. them up. Fantastic. All right, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for taking the time uh, today. And uh, we'll see you again soon, I hope. Great, thank you. We'll talk okay. to you later. Bye-bye.